So the presentation I'm doing here is based on a 32-month uh, mixed-method international comparative study that the HSRC has been doing in Brazil and South Africa. On the one hand, it involves quantitative analysis of homicide, inequality, fear of crime, and social cohesion data. At the same time, it involves two um, ethnographic studies of two major interventions. Um, in one in Cape Town, violence prevention through urban upgrading, and the other one, uh, pacifying police, police units in Rio de Janeiro. It's funded by the IDRC, and we've got partners from uh, the University of Rio de Janeiro, um, at, uh, partners at the Oxford, Oxford University, and the Institute for Security Studies. So I think what my presentation is trying to do is grapple with some of the complexities behind our um, efforts at data collection. Um, it's trying to engage with what actually lies behind these indicators that we put a lot of, a lot of faith in. Um, and how do they actually relate to empirical social conditions on the ground? So that's why we've used ethnography because it uh, allows an understanding of meanings, beliefs, values, and practices of social actors themselves within particular contexts. It tries to understand human experience on its own terms rather than judging it in terms of uh, normative prescriptions. So we, we're not trying to do uh, objective or measurable or quantifiable assessments of the impact of these interventions on social cohesion. Rather, we're trying to understand the meanings that are embedded in the claims of citizens um, about, these, about these interventions. So I thought it would be useful just to start off with a very brief um, sort of look at the definitions of citizen security and social cohesion. Um, this definition of citizen security from the Inter-American Development Bank talks about things like respect for rules, a culture of legality, trust of the citizenry, um, rules of coexistence. Uh, the notion of social cohesion is also very complex, it's very multi-dimensional, some would say very vague, um, but it refers to a number of dimensions including the sharing of common values, economic inclusion, um, participation in public affairs at local and national levels, tolerance of difference, and legitimacy of institutions. So what are some of the commonalities between uh, these concepts? I think implicitly they both refer to the conditions of solidarity in a democratic nation state. They both see factors of mutuality and trust as important, and they're grappling with the notion or the complexities of how societies are actually held together. How do they cohere to create mutual security? I also think they're deeply political concepts, although that's often not acknowledged, and they refer to the terms of citizenship in a democratic <coughs> political community founded on fraternity between citizens. Obviously, in an authoritarian state or a feudal state, uh, you, it, you don't need a relationship between different people in the nation state. In a democratic nation state, you require that. So part of what we've been trying to look at in terms of our ethnographic research in Kailiche, because that's all I'm, I'm reporting on here, is to interrogate the concept of social cohesion and to ask how relevant is it actually to, to con the context of the global south. So far there's been very little empirical work on social cohesion in the global south. Despite this, it's being widely incorporated into many nation states' policies, sometimes in problematic ways. For example, in South Africa, there's been a big focus on consensus around values, which I think can devalue democratic pluralism. There tend to be also theoretical generalizations based on academic literature, which uses survey data from the US and Western Europe. Um, and I think it's important to remember that social cohesion as a policy construct that has really come to the fore since the 1990s was very much conceptualized in the context of Canada, Western Europe, and a variety of multilateral institutions. Obviously, in our study, we're, we're interested in the relationship between social cohesion and violence. So there's a hypothesis that a lack of social cohesion or weak social cohesion is linked to a lack of social control and consequently to increase violence. The, the corollary is that social cohesion can act as a protective factor against violence. There's no uh, um, 
uh, sort of uh, agreement about the, the relationships of causality between the two. That's an ongoing uh, discussion. So again, I think it refers back to a very fundamental issue around um, understanding democracy, is that it's premised on a notion that democratic peace is made possible by some level of community between its subjects, what Balabar has called a space for encounter. Um, so citizens can actually interact with each other in a, in a sense of community um, rather than killing each other. One of the, uh, the more recent developments in the literature around social cohesion, particularly in terms of its relationship to crime, has been the notion of collective efficacy, which Samson has defined as social cohesion among neighbors combined with their willingness to intervene on behalf of the common good. So it's very much about converting social ties into effective collective action. However, I think there are a number of um, problems in, in notions like collective efficacy if applied to, to the context where many of us are working. On the one hand, it tends to assume that there are shared expectations about social control and trust between neighbors. And I think it tends to assume that there's an understanding of and commitment to a common good when we know that most post-colonial societies are deeply heterogeneous and um, and plural. It, for example, in South Africa, social survey data indicates that most people still trust and identify with people from their own social groups rather than in terms of a common uh, South African identity. So the notion of an imagined nation, um, which is uh, Anderson's construct, based on horizontal effective, like emotional ties between citizens, um, is very much in its infancy in a context like, like South Africa. So the place where we've been um, looking at some of these ideas uh, and grappling with them has been the, the township of Kailicha where we've done extended ethnographic field work. Before I'm going to talk on to talk about Kailicha, I think it's very important to emphasize that the conditions in Kailicha are not separate to the conditions in these nice suburbs that we're standing in right now, and that they're both part of the same urban form, a racialized and segregated urban form that was created under apartheid and still very much exists today. Um, Kailicha was actually one of the last uh, townships established under apartheid, and its initial intention was to consolidate all black settlement in the urban areas of the Western Cape. However, at the same time, residents in Kailicha are subjected to extreme levels of violence. The murder rate is between 76 and 108 per 100,000 of the population. And um, social surveys in our own field work indicates that people experience high levels of fear of violence in almost all social spheres. What we found in the field work is contrary to the, the notion that there's no uh, social solidarity, there, that there is actually a lot of social solidarity and social networks in Kailiche. There's numerous forms of informal social organization. And just some examples are uh, stock fells, which are informal saving societies that have lived, uh, existed in many townships for, for, for a long time. There's the legacy of anti-apartheid organization, which is still very much um, in place in just in slightly adapted forms. And in ma many ways, these networks have been critical for people to be able to survive poverty and rep repression. But at the same time, those networks are ambiguous. On the one hand, they can be conduits for friendship and support. At the same time, they can be conduits for exclusion and violence. So in the context of Kailicha, informal networks um, and organizations have a far more significant social and symbolic resonance. I'm wrapping up, <laughs> than formal institutions. So as a result, you have a situation where formal institutions and informal networks coexist and interact with each other. Um, sharing is called this uh, pluralization of security. In general, citizens have an ambiguous relationship to the state, to, to law, and to legality. While they expect the state to provide, provide services and goods, the authority of the state, particularly the police, are deeply contested. 
Another thing is that while Western literature tends to assume that people are individualized, autonomous, and, and the classic sovereign subject, in South Africa there remains a tension between individualism and communitarianism. So as one interviewee argued, individualism is in the head, it's not in the blood. So in Kailicha, many subjects begin from a position of mutual connection. Mutual relations um, with your neighbors, through, with others, is, is the norm. And so these are not individual actors who choose to intervene uh, for the common good, as in Samson's notion of collective efficacy. Uh, this relationship of mutual connection is already inherent in people's identity. It's part of who they are. It's not a conscious you know, decision. And it's woven into the fabric of social life and social organization. However, there's a dark side to these kind of networks and mutuality. One of the classic indicators of social cohesion is do you recognize strangers in your neighborhood? In Kailicha, people do know each other, but this knowing can be a source of violent retribution. So those who are identified as criminals are subject to violent public punishment, as this field report explains. In the evening, the neighbor, neighbors gathered and looked for the young boys who'd been accused of robbery, guns and any object that anyone had were brought in for the search, and they were found and were tortured. So at the same time, those who report crime are known to those who commit crime, as this fruit seller uh, who was attacked at knife point by young gang members whom she knew explained, police take them, the criminals, in today, and the following day they're roaming the street, and your life is in danger. So I thought it's not worth reporting the crime. So while traditional crime prevention approaches are premised on using community knowledge, in this context, knowing can actually be dangerous. So the relationships of mutuality also lead to the violent enforcement against of a moral community against the other. This is also organized as a public spectacle and a, a violent public spectacle. Who the other is shifts from the foreigner to, um, to the gay person to the criminal. Um, just this one field report, and I literally have got two slides to go. Thanks. <laughs> um, it was r roughly around lunchtime when I saw people gathered in front of the Chinese Five Rand store, carrying stones, umbrellas, and brooms from the toilets in the mall. People claimed that the Chinese treat their workers badly, and they were saying that they, sh they should go back to China. In Kailicha, the taxi associations play a critical regulatory function. Um, and they're actually far more powerful presence than, than the police. They're known for their use of coercive force and they're seen as having played a key role and continuing to play a key role in the control of youth gang violence. Generally, there's widespread sanction for the violence of taxi association as well as other forms of violent collective ordering. So in conclusion, um, I think indicators to measure these concepts like social cohesion, collective efficacy, citizen security, need to grapple with the empirical conditions on the ground. They need to recognize the context of subjects outside of ideal normative conditions, their particular subjectivities, their forms of identity, and so on. We need to grapple with how we actually realize our aspiration to overcome violence in ways that engage with the complexity and the specific material uh, conditions are in different contexts. We need to move away from developing generic solutions and indicators that dictate social practice and social norms. Thanks. <laughs>